In my opinion, the best part of a hack and slash can be its fast paced combat. Being able to very quickly kill enemies with flashy and extensive combos can be some of the most satisfying things I'll ever do in a video game. Even in hack and slash games that have fairly restrictive combat styles such as the two recent God of War games, I can still find a way to have fun and make some cool things happen. Now why do I bring this up? Because this opinion is the reason why I don't like Dark Souls and by extension Elden Ring. I never had a problem with the intense difficulty of really any Souls-like. I beat God of War 3 on Chaos Mode so I'm not afraid of a challenge. However, I always felt that the combat was way too slow to derive any actual enjoyment and satisfaction for fighting a difficult boss. And because at the time there weren't many other big name souls like that were as fast as any other hack and slash, I became dismissive of the genre as a whole. So it's safe to say I was extremely cautious when I started playing Sekiro Shadows Die twice. Months after I first started playing it, I can confidently say it's one of my favorite video games of all time. This game is exactly what I wanted in a FromSoft title. In trying to separate itself from its predecessors, it perfectly appealed to me. Instead of placing a focus on strategy and exploration, Sekiro places its focus on combat. It's quick, relentless, unforgiving, and extremely satisfying. It showed me an approach to combat that I never expected but quickly got used to. And after replaying it a total of 6 times for 100%, I felt a clear sense of progress and mastery. Bosses that I called gimmicky bullshit on my first run ended up becoming complete kickwalks on later playthroughs, all except for the Blazing Bull. This game is what I want the Souls-like genre to be, and luckily with games like Thymesia, Lies of P, and Wolong Fallen Dynasty, we're reaching that goal. And with that out of the way, let me explain why Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is the best Soulsborne out there coming from a guy that only played this in Bloodborne. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice was developed by Japanese game dev company From Software and regrettably published by Activision. FromSoft are known for popularizing the Souls-like genre of video games, with Armored Core, Dark Souls, Demon Souls, Bloodborne, this game, and Elden Ring. Everybody and say that I think I want to nominate this award. Sekiro was developed by Hidetaka Miyazaki, who was the director and or supervisor of every other FromSoft title. Development on Sekiro started in late 2015, shortly after Bloodborne received its last DLC, The Old Hunters. Sekiro was inspired by stealth action series Tenju and was originally planned to be a sequel to Tenju until it outgrew the concept. Miyazaki wanted everything about Sekiro to subvert the expectations Dark Souls fans would have had going in. The action-oriented combat was meant to capture the feel of swords clashing. The game was also created to be an entirely single-player experience, again unlike Dark Souls, reason being that multiplayer created limitations they wanted to avoid. For marketing, Sekiro was first revealed at the Game Awards 2017, where the tagline Shadows Die Twice was unveiled. Originally, that tagline was just supposed to be used for marketing, but Activision wanted it to be a part of the final title, so at E3 2018, Microsoft confirmed it was part of the final name. Activision was responsible for publishing Sekiro worldwide, while FromSoft self-published it in Japan and Cube Game published it in the Asia-Pacific region. The game was released for PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Steam on March 22nd, 2019. On October 31st, a free update was released that added new cosmetics for the main character and a boss rush game mode. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice received universal acclaim on PS4 and Xbox, but generally favorable reviews for its PC release. Some critics liked how the game departed from the traditional Dark Souls formula. Despite the main character only having one main weapon, critics praised the amount of choices the player had when compared to Dark Souls and Bloodborne. The combat was also praised as it provides a new perspective to the rules of engagement. Instead of chipping away at an enemy's health, the player is encouraged to break the enemy's posture and go in for the kill when the opportunity arises. The verticality and the level design was also praised. With the help of a gadget the player unlocks, they can scale the highest peaks and the enemies can do the same. As with other Soulsborne titles, the difficulty was very mixed. One side of the argument said that the game was unforgiving and punishes you for missteps, but it should be taking that as an opportunity to learn. Once you learn how to correct those mistakes, you can master the game and feel a sense of gratification inside you. While having a steep learning curve, it was still considered relatively easier than FromSoft's other titles, and also gave you the feeling of being the best swordsman alive. However, game journalists will be game journalists. Many found the game infuriatingly difficult, and a few quit after the 6 hour mark. Sometime after the game was released, modders managed to make software that would increase the stats of the player compared to the bosses. One PC Gamer journalist had to use this software to beat the final boss and said he didn't feel guilty about it at all.
before I continue, I want to lay some ground rules, mostly for myself. The reason I'm doing this is because Sekiro is vastly different from the other games I've covered on my channel. The first is this. This is the first game I've covered that has multiple endings. The endings are Shura, Severance, Purification, and Return. Shura is the bad ending, Severance is the default ending, Purification is the good ending, and Return is the true ending. So in my playthrough, I will be obtaining the Return ending. However, I will be explaining what the other endings are when I get to them and how to get to them. The second is that the footage I'll be using is from a New Game Plus run. The reason is that while I do love this game, I don't want to replay it and lose all of my items, mostly the costumes. Don't worry about me spoiling major events early, all story related items are taken away in New Game Plus until you unlock them again. The third is that there are a lot of side quests, a few of which have different outcomes depending on your choices. The only side quests I'll go in depth on are the ones that are necessary to achieve the return and purification endings. So I won't be, for example, fully explaining Aniyama the Peddler and Kotaro's side quest, but if I need to, I'll lightly elaborate on them. Alright, that should be all, let's get into it. I want to give a brief overview of the game's setting before I actually dissect the story. Sekiro is set in the Sengoku period of feudal Japan. To give a rough overview, the Sengoku period was a time in Japan's history that was plagued by constant civil war from the years 1467 to 1615. This era begins with the establishment of the Ashikaga Shogunate, Japan's military government at the time. After Ashikaga Takeuji established himself as a shogun, Emperor Go-Daigo started a dispute over how to run the country. After this dispute, Japan was separated into two courts, the northern court located in Kyoto and under Ashikaga influence, and the southern court located in Yoshino and ruled by Go-Daigo. Provincial governors were also given some power over their land. Over time, the shogunate lost their influence, causing the warlords, known as daimyo, to fight each other for power. The Sengoku period was brought to an end after Japan's three unifiers managed to bring a relative amount of peace to the land. The first was Nobunaga Oda, using his military awareness and ruthless tactics. The second was his general, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who continued the pacification after Nobunaga was killed in action. He used more diplomatic but still pitiless tactics. Finally, another one of Nobunaga's generals, Tokugawa Ieyasu, defeated all of his opposition in 1601 and established the Tokugawa Shogunate which ruled until 1868. Interesting to note is that despite Sekiro taking place in a real historic era, no real life names of people or locations are mentioned. Alright, the history lesson that I absolutely butchered is over, let's actually talk about Sekiro. The game starts with an opening cinematic. The narrator tells us that it's the end of the Sengoku period. A bloody and beaten soldier is running through a forest until ending up in a battlefield. An enemy is about to kill the bloody soldier until an arrow pierces through his neck, killing him. We then cut to some time later. That same soldier is fighting a shogunate general, General Tamura. Using better tactics and outsmarting his opponent, the soldier manages to slit the general's throat. After declaring his victory, we learn his name, Ishin Ashina. Ishin then led a coup against the government and seized control of the land and became the best swordsman known to man. We cut to the aftermath of the battle where another swordsman, a shinobi, comes across a child. After the shinobi cuts the child's face, he grabs his sword. The shinobi then takes the kid in and raises it. The kid then went on to become a master shinobi just like his father. The older shinobi reminds the kid, now named Wolf, that he must never forget the shinobi code. The father is absolute and the master is second. He's told to defend his new master with his life. Now 20 years after the Ashina clan's coup, the clan was on the brink of collapse. Wolf also lost both his adopted father and the master he was supposed to protect. We then cut to a lady holding an umbrella walking up to a well. She drops a note down the well where it reaches Wolf. Wolf gets up and escapes the well. His current objective is to reach the Moonview Tower where his master is being held. While shimmying across a rock face, he overhears two guards talking. One is concerned over the fact that they didn't restrain him, and another retorts by saying that he's unarmed and he lost his will to live. After some more sneaking around, he enters the Moonview Tower and meets his master, Lord Kuro. After some small banter, Kuro goes and grabs Wolf's old sword, Kusabi Maru. He says that in accordance with the bond of Lord and Retainer, Wolf will pledge his life to him in service. After Kuro asks Wolf if he was injured after a certain event, Wolf says, what event, implying he has some small bit of amnesia. Their current goal is to escape Ashina Castle. Kuro says that there is a secret passage near the moat under the bridge. 
Once he finds the passage, Wolf should signal Kuro with a reed whistle. Wolf leaves the Moonview Tower and kills all the guards surrounding the bridge. Wolf can eavesdrop on a conversation between two guards, saying that they just received orders to guard the passage. After reaching the passage, Wolf uses the reed whistle and Kuro arrives shortly after. They enter a passage and have a bit of banter over where they should go after they escape. They enter a field and are greeted by the man behind all of this, Genichiro Ashina, leader of the Ashina clan and grandson to Ishin Ashina. What's interesting to note is that Genichiro refers to Kuro as the Divine Heir, and this is the first time he's referred to as such. Anyway, Wolf and Genichiro prepare to fight each other. If the player loses the scripted fight like a beta male, Genichiro will simply cut off Wolf's arm. However, if they win the fight like an alpha chad, an enemy will throw a projectile at Wolf, allowing Genichiro to cut his arm off. While Wolf lays on the ground dying, Genichiro abducts Kuro. Wolf then wakes up in an unknown area. In the background, there's an old man carving a Buddha statue. He notices his left arm was replaced with a prosthetic arm. Wolf gets up and talks to the old man, named the Sculptor. The sculptor asks for Wolf's name and he's silent, noting that his eyes look like those of a man who failed his duties. When talking to the sculptor, he says that no matter what he does, every Buddha he carves is an incarnation of wrath, due to him owning a huge karmic debt. He says that all he did was drag Wolf here since he couldn't let him be eaten by a pack of wolves. Apparently some time has passed since Wolf's fight with Genichiro. The sculptor tells Wolf that Kuro still lives, being imprisoned in Ashina Castle. They plan on taking advantage of his blood. The sculptor calls Wolf's new arm the Shinobi Prosthetic, a fitting fang for a one-armed wolf. According to him, it's useless when it comes to carving Buddha. The sculptor offers to upgrade Wolf's prosthetic if he brings in more Shinobi tools. He doesn't know much about Kuro except that his butt is special and it's called the Dragon's Heritage. The sculptor tells Wolf to go outside the temple and find someone he thinks he can get along with, so he does and he finds an Ashina soldier. Wolf refuses to tell the soldier his name, but he's able to deduce that Wolf is a Shinobi. Because of this, he offers to let Wolf face him in battle. Wolf does, and he strikes down the man, only for him to come back up. He appreciates Wolf's swordsmanship, and Wolf rightfully questions what this man is. The man says that some have called him undying, and others infested. He can't die, so he just is. However, he offers to let Wolf use him as sparring practice, to which he accepts. And now that we've met this man named Hanbei the Undying, I want to give a disclaimer. Immortality is a very big plot point in this game, but at this stage it's not important enough to warrant an explanation because there's like three different kinds of immortality. When the time comes, I'll explain all of them. Upon resting at this nearby sculptor's idol, he finds a lady outside of the dilapidated temple, the same one from the opening. She says her name is Emma and can't name her master for the sake of his safety. She's amazed by the power of the dragon's blood. She also says that her master told her to assist Wolf in any way she can, which includes upgrading his medicinal healing board. She also inspects the white mark on Wolf's face, which he says isn't a birthmark. She then theorizes that it's a side effect of the people who use the dragon's heritage. With that, we get to our first area in the game, the Ashina outskirts. Narratively, not much happens in this first area as it's just a few combat encounters, but a few things do happen. The player fights the first mini-boss, General Naomori Kawarada. If the player eavesdrops on a conversation between two soldiers, they'll hear one worry that they won't win their upcoming fight. The other says that there is nothing to worry about. Ishin, while sick, is still capable of fighting. Genichiro is extremely skilled with his bow. And another character, Gyobu the Demon, guards the gate to the castle fiercely. And now I feel like it's a good time to bring this up. Eavesdropping is a core mechanic in Sekiro's storytelling. Most of the time, eavesdropping on a conversation will let you learn about upcoming bosses and what weapons to use to combat them, gain information needed for quest lines, and is even necessary for a big part of purification. After a combat encounter, Wolf comes across an old lady in a destroyed house. She mistakes Wolf for her son Inosuke. After a bit, the lady gives Wolf an old bell charm she made with Kuro in mind. She tells him to offer it to Buddha. Also, when the player dies for the first time, a small cutscene triggers. Kuro will say, and then the player unlocks the resurrection technique, more on that later. Wolf returns to the dilapidated temple and asks the sculptor about the bell charm. Wolf says he doesn't recognize the bell, but the sculptor disagrees. He tells Wolf to give it to the Buddhist statue next to him as an offering, that statue being made by the true sculptor. 
He tells Wolf to close his eyes and let the bell speak to him. He does, and we enter a memory from three years ago. Welcome to the Harada Estate. Wolf wakes up at the Harada Estate three years ago. After climbing down the hill, he finds a soldier laying on the ground dying. The soldier tells Wolf that thieves have broken into the estate and that Kuro is in danger. He also tells Wolf that it's the year of the Dragon Spring pilgrimage, again three years ago. Wolf is talking to himself and knows that despite this being a memory, he can't remember it. For the next few minutes, he travels through the estate path, killing a bunch of bandits along the way. There are also some more conversations to eavesdrop. One of them is Batman Arkham levels of NPC dialogue. Through a house, Wolf can hear a man in pain. He tells, presumably his wife, about a shinobi hunter among the bandits, again teasing the next mini-boss. In another conversation, a man is hiding in a house. He accuses Wolf of leading the bandits here, since according to him, the timing was perfect. After all is said and done, Wolf finds the shinobi hunter. He clears out the bandits surrounding him and then takes on the hunter and kills him. He also ascends more up the path and finds the estate on fire. He also finds his father, who the one NPC referred to earlier as Owl. Owl tells Wolf that Kuro is in danger, but the quickest path to the estate's main hall is covered in fire. He mentions a workaround near the bridge and tells Wolf to use that. Owl then reminds Wolf of the shinobi code. The master is absolute. With that, he draws his final breath. <laughs> Wolf explores a nearby cave and kills some enemies along the way. He finally enters the estate covered in fire, thanks to the bandits. He kills more bandits and finds another swordsman, Nogami Gensai. He decides to aid Wolf during his next encounter, this time against Juzo the Drunkard and his men. There's a high chance Nogami dies during this fight, but if he lives, he'll just tell you to go on ahead and presumably die off screen. After walking through a hallway, Wolf finds another swordsman dying on the floor. He warns Wolf about the audience chamber below them, mentioning dreadful illusion techniques and saying it can't be done without a snap seed. Through context clues, we know that this man is Inosuke, the son of the lady that gave us the bell charm. Wolf enters the audience chamber and finds Kuro under the spell of illusions. After waking him up, a lady enters the room, Lady Butterfly. According to her battle memory, Lady Butterfly was one of Wolf's mentors. She trained him rigorously and taught him about shinobi techniques. After Kuro leaves the room, the two fight each other. Wolf kills Butterfly only to learn that she was an illusion all along. No way! The real Lady Butterfly hops down from the statue and summons more illusions to her side. After a lengthy battle, Wolf kills her. After watching the chamber collapse, Wolf gets stabbed by someone off screen and falls to the floor and dies. However, Kuro saves him from the rubble, saying he can't throw away such loyalty. He then says the same thing we heard earlier. <laughs> Upon awakening, the sculptor is able to put the pieces together. Wolf asks the sculptor what he saw from the Buddha, and he reluctantly tells him. He saw flames, flames of hatred consuming the land and burning Ashina to the ground. And with that little sidetrack complete, we can continue on our main journey. With our detour and Harada estate complete, we head back to the Ashina outskirts stairway. Wolf is able to find a remnant that seems to depict a conversation between Kuro and Emma. The two found a survivor of the Harada estate events, and Emma tells Kuro that there's only a few survivors. Kuro also doesn't like people using his blood, because to him, the dragon's heritage corrupts people. Eavesdropping on this next conversation will tell Wolf about the next mini-boss, the Chained Ogre. It also tells us that the Ogre fears fire, essentially spelling out to the player that they need to use the flame vent against it. This is what I meant earlier when I said that eavesdropping tells us about upcoming bosses. After killing the Chain Ogre, Wolf fights another mini-boss, General Tenzen Yamauchi. After killing Tenzen, Wolf has to make a detour since the bridge to the castle collapsed. So he climbs down a rock face and is greeted by the world's- I mean the Great Serpent. Wolf can't fight the serpent directly so he has to sneak around the mountainside in order to avoid it. After getting far enough, Wolf finds a palanquin. He enters it and waits for the serpent to get close enough to stab it in the eye. 
after which he makes a break for it, nearly loses his life, and ends up outside the gate to Ajina Castle. There's an eavesdropping opportunity available, and it tells Whoop that the Shinobi Firecrackers is the best option against the next actual boss. There's also another remnant, this one between Kuro and Genichiro. Genichiro tells Kuro that the Interior Ministry, the secondary antagonists, are getting far too powerful for Ashina to handle by normal means. Kuro, however, doesn't want Genichiro to use his blood, believing he's willing to lose all humanity to become a fierce defender. After that, we meet the first full boss of the game. Actually? Let's let him introduce himself. My name is Kyobu Masataka Oniwa! After the battle, Wolf kills Gyobu. After the fight, Wolf enters a building and sees a man standing over a dead body. He turns around and tells Wolf to give him his name before he's killed. Wolf is unresponsive and the man mocks him in retaliation. He then recognizes the shinobi prosthetic, saying it reminds him of someone. Because of this, he names Wolf Sekiro. Fun fact, Sekiro is a contraction of the phrase Sekiwa no Okami, which translates to one-armed wolf. The man then calls himself the Tengu of Ashina and offers to let Wolf hunt some rats with him. According to him, rats have snuck into Ashina uninvited and he needs to clear them out. If Wolf accepts Tengu's offer, he'll give Wolf a description of the rats. Tengu promises Wolf a useful reward. Wolf then opens the nearby gate and finds some rats. He kills one of them and then eavesdrops on a conversation. They comment on Ishin's apparent illness and say that Ashina won't last much longer. They mention a character named Black Hat Badger who just becomes a merchant later, finding someone near the Serpent Valley side of the castle. When Wolf returns to Tengu, Tengu gives him the Ashina esoteric text containing the Ashina art skill tree. A few minutes later, after fighting more enemies, Wolf can eavesdrop on two enemies who talk about the next boss. He enters the arena and the bitch ass motherfucker known as the Blazing Bull comes in. After an annoying battle, Wolf kills it. The guards on the other side of the gate open it only to realize that the bull is dead. We then reach Ashina Castle. But we do need to take a detour. Remember when I said I was going for the return ending? Well, getting it requires us to complete an area of the game a little bit earlier than usual. And to start, we'll have to talk to this old lady. She tells us about an area called Senpo Temple on Mount Kongo, and how a very special holy person lives there. Wolf then jumps to this gap and overhears two enemies talking about a mini-boss we'll have to fight at Senpo Temple. After killing more enemies, exploring an abandoned dungeon, and meeting Rex Lapis himself... Dare to purchase an offering? May the departed rest in peace. I will have order! Wolf arrives at Senpo Temple. When Wolf first arrives, he hears a lady talk to him. She tells him that the monks of Senpo Temple have abandoned their faith in pursuit of immortality, and warns him to turn back. Wolf doesn't heed her advice, however, and proceeds anyway. As he climbs up a stairway, he finds a lot of unnaturally aggressive monks. A bit later, we get to our first taste of immortal enemies, since this guy comes back shortly after getting killed. Wolf meets up again with the lady from the Ashina Bridge. Here she tells Wolf about two fruits of the serpent, one dried and one fresh. Both of these will be tackling for return. She also tells him to, should he need anything, bless her with rice from the Divine Child, whoever that is. Wolf then clears a combat encounter and climbs up the Shugendo mountainside. At the top of the mountain, he walks through a bridge until a man completely covered in armor shows up. This is the mini-boss that two enemies near the Ashina Castle were talking about. This man, named the Armored Warrior, is completely immune to attacks damaging his vitality. However, Wolf tricks him into creating holes in the walls and damages his posture enough to knock him off the bridge. He then clears enemy after 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 enemy. After narrowly avoiding death, Wolf finds a priest. The priest is talking to himself, begging for forgiveness from the children of the rejuvenating waters. 
He says there's one child left and she must be lonely trapped inside of a room by herself. He notices Wolf and wants to know what he's doing at Senpo Temple. He tells the priest that he's seeking the holy person. The priest tells Wolf that the child isn't in the room they're in anymore, being locked in the inner sanctum. He says it's impossible to raise the child, then asks if Wolf is a shinobi. Wolf doesn't respond, but the priest will ask him for a favor. Should he raise the child in the inner sanctum, he should give her a book called The Holy Chapter Infested. He says that the child wanted to know the reason for her fate. And that's where we can stop for now because we have to go back to Alshina Castle. After fast traveling back to the Alshina Castle gate, Wolf comes across another remnant with Kuro and Emma. Kuro uses the reed whistle to try and call Wolf back to no avail. He says that he'll return to the top of Ashina Castle. After that, Wolf runs across some rooftops and finds an Ashina general rallying his troops. He then jumps down and kills the general and the troops. For now, let's take a little detour and talk about something called Dragon Rot. I'm only doing this now because this is the part of the playthrough that triggered it for me. Should the player die enough times, the cutscene will trigger. This is similar to the first sculptor scene, except he's now coughing. That's because he's been inflicted with a disease known as Dragon Rot. He wearily tries to explain Dragon Rot to Wolf to no avail. Wolf then goes outside and meets Emma. She tells him that the power of the dragon's heritage can bless anyone with immortality. However, repeated use can lead to stagnation in a person's body, causing those without the dragon's heritage to become sick. Wolf asks Emma if there is a way to cure the Dragon Rot, but she needs to look through old mentor's notes to see. After resting, Emma can be seen getting a blood sample from the sculptor in order to study it. She says that the sculptor's blood alone isn't enough for her, so she asks Wolf to get a blood sample of anyone else inflicted. At this point, the player has to look at their Rot Essence item and figure out who is affected by Dragon Rot. I got the Faithful One, which is the lady that asks us for rice from the Divine Child. Wolf finds her lying on the ground, wheezing, barely able to talk. Wolf grabs a blood sample from her and returns to Emma. She then continues her research on Dragon Rot. After resting at a sculptor's idol, Emma says she found the solution. She says that the source of the Dragon Rot is the stagnation in Wolf's blood. The Dragon's heritage only has a set amount of power it can use. When Wolf tries to resurrect himself and he's out of that power, the resurrection will still occur, but it has to draw power from somewhere else. Not somewhere else being normal people. For the victims of the Dragon Rot, their life force was taken from them so Wolf could resurrect, and their blood is stagnated. According to her, it can be cured by giving back what has been taken. She hands Wolf a Dragon's Blood Droplet and a Recovery Charm. Wolf goes to the Sculptor's Idol and offers the Droplet, curing everyone of the Dragon Rot. Now, whenever people are inflicted by Dragon Rot, Wolf can cure everyone using a Droplet. With that detour now finished, we can continue across the rooftops of the Asiata Castle. On the roofs, Wolf can see assassins similar to the ones seen in the opening. These are called Nightjar, shinobi that serve the Ashina clan. Wolf finds an open window near the back and uses it to enter the castle. Inside, there will be Ishin's pupils patrolling the castle. Wolf kills two of them and two old grandmas that literally pose no threat. He then enters a dojo and fights the next mini-boss, Ashina Elite Jinsuke Saze. Wolf then reaches the rooftop of Ashina Castle. On the roof, Genichiro stares at the watchtower that Ishin is currently in. Emma is also here and tells Genichiro that it's a miracle Ishin is even alive. He walks over to Kuro and once again asks Kuro to accept Genichiro to his immortal oath. Kuro again denies his request, saying that Wolf is his shinobi and will return to him no matter what. Hey, speak of the devil. Wolf and Genichiro draw their blades and fight each other. This time, Wolf is victorious. Genichiro tells him that he deserves better and asks if he would serve a different lord, to which Wolf responds with heresy. Genichiro then says that he'll seek any form of heretical strength, shedding his armor and officially becoming Genichiro Way of Toboe. Now he can control lightning, and does so unsuccessfully. After the fight, Emma walks upstairs and meets Wolf again. She tells him that she means no harm, but her attention is diverted to Genichiro, who is resurrected. He used something called the Rejuvenating Waters to bring himself back, after he jumps off the rooftop. Now the landscape of Ashina has changed to a more grey and snowy setting. Wolf talks to Emma, who is waiting at the top of the stairs. She tells Wolf that she serves Ishin and says that Ishin doesn't want to use the dragon's heritage. That's the reason why he tried to help Kuro escape Ashina in the beginning of the game. She also tells Wolf that Kuro is just downstairs. 
Wolf goes downstairs and reunites with Kuro. Wolf wants them to escape Ashina, but Kuro has another plan. He says that his blood causes people to become undying. According to him, undying begets stagnation and can easily corrupt people. He wants to sever the chains of stagnation caused by the dragon's heritage. He then asks Wolf if he'll aid him in his quest. Wolf says he can't because of the Iron Coat, and protecting Kuro is what Owl entrusted him to. When asked about how many times he died for Kuro's sake, Wolf says that doesn't matter as long as he's safe. Kuro says that he doesn't want to bind Wolf to an eternity of undeath, and again asks him to help sever the ties of immortality. Wolf then obliges. This is when the true plot of the game actually begins. When interacting with Kuro again, he'll show Wolf an item called the Immortal Severance Text. It was apparently an ancient item kept in Alshina Castle. Wolf is obviously confused, but Kuro is adamant that they can use Dragon Tears to sever the dragon's heritage. Wolf then asks a good question, and Kuro points him towards an incense burner. Kuro tells the story of another divine heir that was living in Ashina Castle, Lord Takeru. Apparently he died a good while ago. His final words were, Trapped in the aroma of the Fountainhead, I return to the Divine Realm. That means that the scent of the Fountainhead is the key they need to reach the Divine Realm. Kuro is sure that some of Takeru's old research books remain in the castle, so he'll search for them. Wolf says that they should also look into how they should actually sever the immortal ties, and Kuro suggests finding Ishin. The two then walk near a window. Kuro says that Ishin is recuperating in one of the watchtowers near Ashida Castle, the one Kinichiro was looking at earlier. On the roof, there is a path controlled by the Nightjar who use smoke signals as landmarks. Wolf should be able to use the smoke signals to reach Ishin, which he does successfully. Once Wolf reaches the watchtower, Ishin gives Wolf a bottle of unrefined sake. In case you didn't know, there are a total of four different kinds of sake the player can offer to Emma, the sculptor, and Ishin, all providing just a few extra dialogue options. Back to the topic, Ishin tells Wolf that Genichiro was bewitched by the rejuvenating waters. When Wolf mentions the code his father taught him, Ishin realizes he's the son of Owl. He also says, the bonds that tie us are so deeply amusing, don't you think, Sekiro? Confirming that Ishin and Tengu are indeed the same person. When Wolf tells Ishin that Kuro wishes to perform Immortal Severance, Ishin mentions the Mortal Blade. The Mortal Blade is a weapon that's capable of killing a person that can't die by conventional means. It references a form of undying called the Infested, which we've only seen through Hanbei the Undying. According to stories Ishin's heard, you could cut their head off and they wouldn't die. When asked where the Mortal Blade can be found, Ishin says it's held in Senpo Temple. However, the Mortal Blade can't be drawn, well, according to rumors. This is normally the part of the playthrough where players would need to complete Senpo Temple, but we already did that to obtain the return ending, so we're good. Before leaving the room, there's a neat little tidbit I want to mention. Remember when I said giving sake was an extra option presented to players? Well, if the player gives Ishin the sake he gave us, he'll ask Wolf how it felt fighting Genichiro. Wolf then asks what exactly the Lightning of Tomoe he mentioned is. Ishin says it's a technique that belonged to Lady Tomoe, Genichiro's old mentor. She apparently had unique swordsmanship akin to dancing, almost to a mesmerizing degree. Ishin himself almost fell victim to her. Now that we finished talking to Ishin, Wolf returns to Kuro's room and finds him in a library. He tells Kuro everything Ishin told him, including the Mortal Blade. While Wolf was gone, Kuro was looking in the library for any records of the Fountainhead Aroma. He tells Wolf about the first clue, a flower. He hands Wolf a record talking about a fragrant flower. It is said that the relatives of Tomoe once gathered the Fountainhead fragrance and arrived at the palace. You may find a key where the waters of rejuvenation converge in a deep pool, a white and deeply fragrant flower. When trying to think of where the waters of rejuvenation would converge, Wolf suggests a deep valley, specifically the Sunken Valley. Wolf and Kuro agreed that this specific sunken valley should be where the Fountainhead waters converge. Near the rear of the castle, there's a shrine dedicated to the Great Serpent. From there, he'll be able to access the sunken valley. After this discussion, Wolf meets up with Emma again. He tells her that Ishin thanked him for defeating Gedichiro. She then brings up the rejuvenating sediment, which is a concentrated portion of the rejuvenating waters. While it technically doesn't provide immortality like the Dragon's Heritage, one's flesh will become greatly resilient, being able to withstand otherwise fatal blows. Her mentor dedicated his life to researching it, but all of his records were destroyed. She asks Wolf if he talked to Kuro about all this, and he tells her about their plans to sever immortality. She then says she'll keep helping him like she has been all this time. 
Like I said earlier, players would normally have to go and complete Sempo Temple now, but since we already did that, we can just fast travel over to the main hall. Once we're at the main hall, Wolf finds a bell sitting on a table. He rings it and prays, which takes him to the mysterious Hall of Illusions. Here Wolf can see two folding screens that depict three monkeys. These three monkeys, based on my limited research, are based on Japan's three wise monkeys from an old pictorial maxim. These are see no evil, which the purple monkey represents, hear no evil, which the green monkey represents, and speak no evil, which the orange monkey represents. There is, however, a fourth white monkey that's completely invisible, both on the folding screen and in the hall. I don't know what sort of maxim or proverb that guy represents, but whatever. Wolf kills all the monkeys in the Hall of Illusions, and they all, I guess, become trapped inside the folding screens. At the same time, a voice can be heard telling Wolf that they will only try to keep her hidden. It's safe to assume this is the same person that tried to warn us at the beginning of Senpo Temple. She tells him to close his eyes and pray, and once he does, he's transported to the inner sanctum where this person is. He walks inside and finds the divine child of rejuvenation. She is the sole surviving child that was put through the Senpo monk's cruel experiments to create a false dragon's heritage. They tried to use the rejuvenating waters to create a replica of the dragon's heritage, and put probably hundreds of kids through the ringer to see if it worked. Again, this child is the only one that survived the process. Actually, right before the Armored Warrior fight, Wolf can find a field full of red and white pinwheels. These pinwheels represent each of the children that died in the monk's pursuit of immortality. But if Wolf ventures off the beaten path, he can find a white pinwheel, this one representing the Divine Child. There's an NPC in the beginning of Senpo Temple named Kotaro that will want this pure white flower as he calls it so he can get spirited away. The Divine Child will ask Wolf why he's here, which is for the Mortal Blade. She asks him if he wishes to draw the blade despite the risks, and he says yes. She then pulls out a case that has the blade in it. Wolf picks up the blade, begins to draw it, and then dies. However, to the Divine Child's amazement, he comes back to life and fully draws the blade. Wolf tells the Divine Child that he and Kuro wish to sever the ties of immortality. She says she read up on a way to sever the dragon's heritage and rightly assumes that Kuro resents his power. She tells Wolf who she is, a creation of the monks that stopped at nothing to achieve immortality. She decides to assist Wolf and Kuro in their journey since she agrees with Kuro. She then gives Wolf a handful of rice, which is just a pellet's item on steroids. As a bit of a detour, now that the player has the mortal blade, they can return to Hanbei the Undying. He'll ask Wolf what his sword is, and after realizing it's not a legend, he'll ask Wolf to kill him with it. If Wolf accepts Hanbei's wish, he'll ask for a merciful death. He'll then prepare for the great beyond, meaning we have to rest at a sculptor's idol. Once Wolf comes back, Hanbei will be kneeling, preparing for his death. After making sure this is what he really wants, Wolf rips the centipede out of him and kills it, allowing Hanbei to finally die. If the player does this, they won't be able to practice new moves anymore, but they'll get a neat item. Hey all, sorry for the terrible audio and video quality, I'm recording this like an hour or so before I have to go to work. There are a few things that I only learned after finalizing the script and doing all my voiceovers, so I'm going to be popping in and out occasionally telling you what those things that I learned are. The first is this, I'm only mentioning this now because Hanbei's story in the game is essentially complete. However, there is an entire manga prequel series called just Sekiro's side story, Hanbei the Undying. It was drawn by Shin Yamamoto, who, from what I know, has made a bunch of Monster Hunter mangas. And there has been supervision from, from software. And it is, it is straight up an entire manga that covers the story of Hanbei the Undying. And normally I'm a bit hesitant about things like this, mostly because of God of War's Fallen God series where like comics like this don't really add anything of substance to the already existing source material. But from what I've read from what I've read so far, this one's pretty good. I haven't actually finished it yet. I think I'm on volume two right now. But it is pretty good. The first volume is completely free on Amazon, but the other seven or eight aren't, so I just picked up the paperback and that's how I'm reading it here. And yeah, that's just all I wanted to say for now. I'll probably be popping in one or two more times. Just wanted to let you know. Wolf travels back to the Inner Sanctum and gives the Divine Child the Holy Chapter Infested. She says she can't help but to detest the people that put her through the experiments. 
After eating enough rice, the divine child would doze off and give Wolf some rice. The next time Wolf returns, she's seen panting and pretty sick. When Wolf asks what he can do for her, she says she wants a persimmon. The best place to get one for her is this memorial mob merchant near the Shugendo Sculptor's Idol. When Wolf gives her the persimmon, she eats it. She then hands Wolf some rice, saying that the crop was plentiful because of the persimmon. She also hands Wolf a bag of rice meant for Kuro. Now that we've gotten the mortal blade, let's go to the sunken valley and try to get the flower Kuro wanted. Wolf ventures around the backside of the castle, walks through a forest, and finds the Great Serpent Shrine. Inside the shrine, the Tengu of Ashina, or in layman's terms, Ishin, is standing over the corpse of an interior ministry member he killed. If the player has fully completed at least one of the four skill trees they'll have unlocked, Ishin will give Wolf the Mushin Esoteric Text, which will contain the Mushin Art skill tree. Afterwards, Wolf can jump down this ravine and enter the Sunken Valley. He's greeted by a few enemies that have makeshift rifles and bandages covering their faces. Deeper in the valley, he'll find another one of these enemies, but he has a makeshift shotgun. Over by a rock, there will be a dying Senpo rat. He tells Wolf about the gun fort being worse than they expected. Wolf then jumps across these rocks, avoiding constant gunfire, and fights the first of two Snake Eyes and mini bosses, this one being Snake Eyes Shirafuji. He kills them and then continues. He crosses the cavern and kills more gun fort people. He then enters the gun fort shrine and fights the second Long Arm 70p mini boss. The first one was off the main path in Senpo Temple, so I didn't feel like mentioning it at the time. Wolf uses the shrine key to open this door and tries to cross the bridge until. Wolf has to swim past the Great Serpent and run into this cavern. He climbs up another mountain face and reaches Bodhisattva Valley, an area inhabited by monkeys with guns and swords. He clears out this giant circle of monkeys and reaches a watering hole. Once inside the watering hole, he has to fight the next boss, the Guardian Ape. After an annoying fight, Wolf uses the sword lodged in its throat to chop its head off, killing the ape. Bless you. Whoa, a second phase! I bet you didn't see that coming. I saw it coming. I saw it coming because I watched the donkey video before playing this. What the fuck? What the f No! 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 What? Anyway, in his second phase, the ape uses a sword that was in its throat and it's also puppeteered by a centipede. At the end of the fight, Wolf rips out the centipede and kills it. Don't ask me why he doesn't finish it off with a mortal blade. Wolf then walks inside the cave the ape was guarding and finds a sakura flower. And now that we've become acquainted with all the different forms of immortality, let's discuss them. Fair warning, some of the lore in Sekiro is really convoluted, and this is one of those, so I might end up getting some bits and pieces wrong, but don't blame me, blame the game. Alright, so the first kind of immortality is the only true immortality, the Dragon's Heritage. At one point, Lord Takeru plucked a flower from the Divine Realm as a parting relic and planted it in Ashina. It grew to become a beautiful Sakura tree, the Ever Blossom tree, but one of its branches was stolen by an unknown individual, causing the entire tree to die. Kuro is the current Divine Heir of the Dragon's Heritage. Because of this, he's able to impart an immortal oath to someone, that someone being Wolf. Because of this, Wolf can die and resurrect as many times as he wants. However, this power is limited, repeated use leads to his blood becoming stagnated, so if he tries to resurrect, the dragon's heritage has to steal the life force of ordinary people as a substitute and inflict those people with dragon rot. The second kind of immortality is the rejuvenating waters. These are bodies of water that flow out from the divine realm. The monks of Sempon Temple dedicated their lives to using the rejuvenating waters to create a false dragon's heritage. During the process, they abducted children and performed various tests on them, almost none of which succeeded. As we know already, the Divine Child is the sole survivor. There's also a concentrated part of the rejuvenating waters called the rejuvenating sediment. Drinking from this sediment will increase a person's resilience and make them survive attacks that would have otherwise killed them. The only person we know that drank from the sediment was Genichiro. The third kind of immortality, which is really just an extension of the second one, is the infested. These are centipedes that, I assume, come from the rejuvenating waters. This form of immortality is more of a parasitic relationship between the centipede and its host. We met Hanbei the Undying, who was unable to die because of the centipede he had, and then there were the monks of Senpo Temple who were also infested. 
However, the centipedes are also able to puppeteer their host's corpse after they die, example being the guardian ape. We killed it after its first phase, but the centipede took control of its body. How the centipede learned to use its sword, I don't know. There will be more examples of infested enemies later, but so far we only know of the ape and the senpo monks. Alright, convoluted and confusing description of immortality aside, we can now return to Kuro's room. For this section of the video, I'm going to be blasting through the quest line needed to get the return ending. Back at Kuro's room, Wolf will hand Kuro the bag of rice the Divine Child wanted him to give. When Wolf tells Kuro that it's sweet when you bite into it, Kuro suggests cooking the rice. When Wolf rests at a sculptor's idol and comes back to Kuro, he'll receive a sweet sticky rice ball. Wolf eats it and then returns to the inner sanctum. Wolf tells her Kuro made the rice balls, which surprises her. She'll then ask for his name and Wolf says Lord Kuro. When Wolf rests and returns to the inner sanctum, the Divine Child is nowhere to be seen. Now she's in the Hall of Illusions where we fought the folding screen monkeys. Wolf enters the hall and finds her talking to the children of the rejuvenating waters. She's conflicted because she wants to help Wolf and Kuro, but that'll mean abandoning her friends. After she notices Wolf is right behind her, she suggests an idea. Instead of severing the dragon's heritage, they could just return it to its homeland, that being somewhere in the west. The only problem is she doesn't know where the exact destination would be. She thinks the high priest of Senpo Temple, the guy we got the holy chapter from, would know where they need to go. She says he can be found somewhere in a cave near the inner sanctum. Wolf explores the cave and eventually finds the high priest, but he's dead. He's also carrying the holy chapter Dragon's Return. With the book, Wolf returns to the inner sanctum. He tells the divine child that the priest was dead, which confuses her because he was infested. He then hands her the book. She reads the book and sees that consuming two persimmons of the serpent will allow someone to become a cradle for the divine heir. She then decides that she will become the cradle. The divine child will ask Wolf, should he decide to go with her plan, to bring her two fruits of the serpent. As a starting point, she tells Wolf that the liver of the great serpent is stained red and like a persimmon. In order to obtain the fresh serpent viscera, Wolf has to return to the first Senpo temple sculptor's idol. He finds a Senpo rat and using the puppeteer ninjutsu, he commands the rat to fly a kite. Wolf then travels to Shugendo, finds the kite, and jumps across the chasm with it. He climbs down the side of the mountain and eventually reaches the Sunken Valley Passage, with the Great Serpent sleeping below. He jumps off his plank and, in an oddly beautiful way, he kills the Great Serpent. Doing this will get Wolf the Fresh Serpent Viscera. The next one is the Dried Serpent Viscera. This one will be located in Bodhisattva Valley, the area before we fought the Guardian Ape. Wolf travels across in poisonous waters and enters a cave. In the cave, you can see another great serpent. Yes, these two serpents aren't the same, but I did see a theory online that the two share the same body. Inside the cave, Wolf finds a monkey cowering in fear. He puppeteers that one and it becomes a distraction, allowing Wolf to cross the bridge and obtain the Dried Serpent Viscera. He returns to the Inner Sanctum and presents both items to the Divine Child. She then eats both of them and starts to become the cradle needed for the Dragon's Heritage. If the player travels and returns back to the Inner Sanctum, the door will be shut. Wolf can eavesdrop here and hear that the Divine Child is writhing in pain. That's all we can do for now. Wolf returns to Kuro's room and tells him that he got the flower from the Sunken Valley. Kuro tells Wolf that there's another scent that the Fountainhead incense will need, this being Kuro's own blood. Now they need to figure out how to make Kuro bleed. Wolf suggests asking Emma since she's a doctor. Wolf then talks to Emma and brings her up to speed. She tells Wolf that the solution has been on his back the entire time. In other words, it's the Mortal Blade. Emma then hands Wolf a note written by Lord Takeru and says that, with the Mortal Blade, he'll be able to make Kuro bleed. Wolf runs back to Kuro and tells him about the Mortal Blade and the stuff with the Divine Child. Kuro then tells Wolf about the third ingredient for the incense, a stone. He hands Wolf a note talking about a stone in the depths of Ashina. According to the note, there is a village deep under Ashina that contains the stone. The entrance is near the well Wolf was in at the beginning, the one near the Moonview Tower. After that, Wolf tells Kuro that they can use the Mortal Blade to make him bleed. 
Wolf is a bit worried since neither of them know how the blade's going to affect Kuro. Wolf then suggests lighting the incense burner to protect him. Now Wolf has to head for this mysterious village and get the stone. Wolf reaches the well from the beginning and finds a man standing over it. The man calls himself Jinzeman Jumano and he's plagued by a voice in his head, calling him to the well. Wolf hops into the well and finds another man standing there. He's talking to himself and says he wants to meet the incompetent shinobi one day. Well, he got his wish. Wolf continues exploring, fights a mini boss that has no narrative relevance, and finds Jinzeman again. He's still plagued by the voices in my head and believes the voice is calling out to him. He asks Wolf if he can hear the voice, but he can't. Nonetheless, he's determined to follow that melody. What is that melody? Just after meeting Jinzeman, Wolf finds a faithful one sitting at the end of a cliff. She tells him that if he wishes to reach the depths of Ashina, he must cast himself out. He walks over to the edge and jumps. Wolf manages to grapple onto a nearby surface and descends further into the caves. He eventually finds a poison pool with a few enemies from the gun fort, including Snake Eye Shirahagi. After the fight, Wolf finds a dying gun fort person and he says that a large ape attacked him. Don't tell me. Are you fucking kidding me? You know, this wouldn't have happened if you had just used the Mortal Blade the first time. That's more like it. After escaping this cavern, Wolf again finds Jinzeman still following that melody. He says he finally managed to see the source of the melody, if only for a split second. Trust me, this does become important later. Now he's in an area surrounded by fog and apparitions. After a good while, Wolf finds an abandoned house and enters it through a hole in the roof. He finds some odd creature called a Mist Noble playing a flute. He drops down and kills a Mist Noble, which gets rid of all the fog in the area. With all the fog gone, he's able to find the village buried under Ashina, Mibu Village. Mibu Village is inhabited by more of the Undying. These enemies will be brought back to life after being killed, even if they're killed by the Mortal Blade as far as I know. After blitzing through the village, Wolf finds Jinzeman one last time. He says he can hear the melody and he's sure the source of it is just beyond this path. He believes the source, which is a Shamisen player, was waiting for him this entire time. Wolf walks up the path and finds the Shamisen player. He asks her why she's crying, and she says it's because she hasn't been able to see her Lord Sakuza in a while. She sends countless letters to Lord Sakuza, but he never responded to any of them. She then asks Wolf if he knows where Lord Sakuza is. He tells her he doesn't, which angers her. She then becomes our next mini-boss, Oren of the Water. Wolf then passes by an abandoned house and finds our next mainline boss, the corrupted monk. She's a large, glaive wielding apparition that guards the doors to this cave. Wolf kills her and the gates open. He walks into the cave and finds a shelter stone, the ingredient needed for the incense. However, if we try to fast travel back to Kuro's room, we'll quickly notice that we can't. In fact, all of the Ashina Castle sculptor's idols are locked. Why? Well, let's return to the abandoned dungeon. Outside of the abandoned dungeon, there's an Ashina soldier. Apparently, he hasn't seen any of his comrades in a while. Out by the bridge, there's another soldier cowering in fear. Then, a man with a red hat and two swords comes walking out. Welcome to Central Forces. While we were gone, they started their invasion of Ashina. Now, Wolf has to retake Ashina Castle step by step. Only on top of Ishii's pupils, we fight interior ministry soldiers, including a lone shadow where the Ashina elite was originally. While wandering around the castle, if the player wants to, they can go to the watchtower where we first met Ishin. Once there, an eavesdrop opportunity will appear and Wolf will overhear a conversation. This bit of dialogue is what starts the quest line needed for the purification ending. Emma will say that she's concerned about the Tenku, and Ishin responds by saying that Genichiro will probably show up soon and make use of the other mortal blade. 
he is determined to not let Genichiro use Kuro's blood. Ishin says that Genichiro can only use the blade a few more times, and after that, the Tengu will be no more. Emma brings up our mortal blade, and Ishin just butters Wolf up. Also on the other side of the Watchtower, Wolf can find an item called the Black Scroll. This item talks about the black mortal blade that Ishii mentioned, apparently called the Open Gate. According to this scroll, it has the ability to open a gate to the underworld. After this endeavor, Wolf climbs up to the rooftop and sees Kuro talking to someone. Turns out Owl isn't dead, no way! Kuro thinks Owl is plotting something, but he merely wants to protect Kuro from anyone that wants his blood. Kuro believes Owl is lying out of his ass and tells him to fuck off. Owl, however, decides to stick around for a bit. Wolf uses his time to catch up with Owl. Both of them were certain that each other had died the night of the Harada Estate attack. Wolf says that the power of the Divine Air brought him back, and that excites Owl. He determines out the power of the Dragon's Blood for himself. Owl then reminds Wolf of the Shinobi Code, and tells him to forsake Kuro. This confuses Wolf, but now he's left with a choice. The two options present are Obey the Iron Code, Forsake Kuro, and Break the Iron Code, Protect Kuro. The first option will earn players a Shura ending, and the other will unlock the other three endings. We're going to choose the first option first, since Shura is the quickest ending to obtain. Should Wolf choose to forsake Kuro, he'll renounce the oath he had to him. After Owl calls Wolf a good boy, none other than Emma shows up and readies her blade. Owl throws a few shurikens at her, which she quickly deflects. Owl then leaves Emma to Wolf, and the two get ready to fight. Emma says she witnessed Shura once already and is determined to not let it happen again. The two then clash and the fight ends with Wolf stabbing Emma in the throat. Wolf basks in the victory until Ishin shows up. Ishin says that Wolf wasn't the best of people he knew, but he can never actually hate Wolf. He's now determined to kill Wolf before he becomes Shura. Wolf's final opponent is now the greatest swordsman to ever exist. Despite being terminally ill, he's still incredibly skilled with his blade and even pulls fire out of his ass in his second phase. Wolf powers through it all and kills Ishin Ashina. Owl then returns and notices Ishin lying on the ground dead. While talking, Owl places some weird black thing down next to Ishin. Sorry to get off topic, but there's a neat little secret behind that thing. Data miners were able to break the camera during this cutscene and get a good look at what Owl was holding. They found out it was actually Genichiro's head Owl was holding. So while we were fighting Emma and Ishin, Owl went out and killed Genichiro, which I thought was a really cool easter egg. While holding the black mortal blade that also belonged to Genichiro, he proclaims his victory. However, during his speech, I, the Wolf kills Owl. While dying, Owl realizes the error of his ways. Kuro also comes climbing up the stairs and stares in horror as Wolf picks up the black mortal blade. Now, Wolf has become Shura. The ending narration says that Ashina then became the site of the largest massacre in the Sengoku era. Soldiers, women, children, all were needlessly murdered in Wolf's Wake. The narrator also says that for a good while after, a demon lurked the land. Now you're probably wondering, what is Ashura? Well luckily, I can tell you. Ashura is a manifestation of karmic debt. The more one kills without remorse, without reason, the more karma they build up. Eventually, they kill too much and only start killing for the pure joy. In this ending, Wolf succumbs to Shura, becomes the demon that only exists to kill, and is essentially unstoppable, since he now wields the only two weapons capable of killing him. Also, if someone fails to become Shura, they end up becoming a demon of hatred. No, I am not foreshadowing a future boss in a not-so-subtle manner. Why would you think that? Alright, the Shura ending is done, now let's talk about the rest of the game. We're going to return to the Iron Code choice from earlier. Should Wolf choose to say little to Kuro, Owl will be taken aback. He will then fall to the floor and ask Wolf why he can't understand him. 
Wolf says that a code must be determined by the individual, something Kuro indirectly taught him. Owl reacts by failing to perform a sneak attack on Wolf. Wolf pushes Owl back and the two fight each other. After a good long fight, Wolf kills Owl and obtains the aromatic branch. Now we're going to blitz through the entire purification questline. Wolf runs into Kuro's room and is able to eavesdrop on him three times. First, Kuro says, we're almost there. Yes, do what must be done. Then, he says, he's so strong. I wish I was. Finally, he says, when did you lose your path, Lord Genichiro? Wolf then walks to Kuro and tells him that he killed Owl. He then tells Kuro that Owl was holding onto the branch. He recognizes it as being part of the Everblossom tree. After some out of order dialogue, Wolf goes upstairs and talks to Emma. Wolf believes Kuro is hiding something. Emma mentions that Lord Takeru mentioned beheading in his memoirs. She believes the beheading is a way to both sever immortality and end the Divine Heir's life. Emma tells Wolf that if he walks the path of Immortal Severance, he'll need to kill Kuro. She understands that Kuro wants to perform Immortal Severance, but hopes there's a way to do it without him dying. She'll then ask Wolf to aid her, to which he accepts. Emma knows a good place to start, something related to Lady Tomoe. After resting, Emma hands Wolf a note from Lady Tomoe that says she wanted to perform purification but couldn't because she couldn't find the mortal blade. The note also says that there is a way to get rid of the dragon's heritage and turn the divine heir into a normal person. The purification ritual requires a flower from the Everblossom, which is going to be hard to get on account of the tree dying. Wolf shows Emma the branch Owl stole, but it has no flowers on it. Emma then decides to visit the graves of Lord Takeru and Lady Tomoe, since that was where the Everblossom originally grew. Wolf travels to the old grave area of Ashina and finds Emma. Wolf asks Emma if she remembered anything, but she says she didn't. She thinks one of her old friends can help, that friend being Orangutan, a nickname for the sculptor. Wolf arrives at the dilapidated temple and sneaks around back. He then eavesdrops on another conversation. The sculptor asks Emma if she's alright with the fact that, to perform a mortal severance, either Wolf or Kuro has to die. Emma says that if she gives this to Wolf, he'll die. Wolf then enters a dilapidated temple and confronts Emma. She says the sculptor wasn't able to help, but Wolf brings up what he overheard. Emma says she had a vision of the day the branches of the Everblossom tree faded away. Lady Tomoe tried to commit suicide because in order for purification to work, the one oath bound by the dragon's heritage has to die, in this case, Wolf. Reminder, she couldn't perform purification because she didn't have the mortal blade. Emma says she doesn't want to lose Wolf or Kuro, but all paths are leading to dead ends. Wolf then asks her what she's hiding. Emma hands Wolf Owl's Bell Charm, another bell charm we can offer to the Buddhist statue. Wolf offers the bell charm to the Buddhist statue, and we return to Harada Estate, this time at the place Owl died. Now instead of Owl, we see a lone shadow mini boss we have to fight. After fighting the lone shadow, we get to cut through a majority of Harada Estate up until fighting Juzo the Drunkard again. Only instead of regular bandits, Juzo is aided by an interior ministry member. After the fight, Wolf enters the audience chamber where he fought Lady Butterfly before, and instead fights Owl. Owl says that the day he pulled Wolf from the battlefield, he had no idea what he'd become, and then says he'll put him down. Then, after one of the most difficult fights in the game, Wolf kills Owl again. Alright, funny thing, when Wolf first kills Owl, he says, Death of a Shadow, and here he kills Owl a second time. So I guess you could say, the shadow died twice. Also, killing Owl earns Wolf the aromatic flower, and this officially ends the purification questline. Wolf returns to Kuro's room and tells him that he got the ingredients needed for the aroma. The two just comment on the appearance of the shelter stone and then talk about the wedding cave the stone was in. Wolf also suggests that the wedding cave might be the way to the divine realm. With everything needed, Wolf placed the stone and the flower into the incense burner. However, they still need the last ingredient, Kuro's blood. So Wolf unsheathes the mortal blade, and Kuro makes a small cut on his chest. Kuro comments on the incense, saying it's nostalgic. 
Now that the Fountainhead incense is complete, the two wonder how they get to the Divine Realm in the first place. Wolf says that a sweetly scented bridal offering was etched into the altar the stone was on. The two then agree and think the Wedding Cave is the gateway to the Divine Realm. But before we go to the Wedding Cave, let's take our last detour to the Inner Sanctum. Once there, the doors actually open and we can talk to the Divine Child. She'll ask Wolf if he's really there and he'll comment on her eyes. She says she succeeded in becoming the cradle for the Divine Heir. She then asks him to hold out his hand and she gives him a frozen tear. Her tears freeze as they flow down to her face. This is probably what the Dragon's Return text referred to as cold dragon tears. Kuro has to drink both the frozen tears and the dragon's tears for the cradling ritual to be performed. If he does, then he'll be able to rest within the Divine Child. Now we can earn the return ending and just need to complete the game. Wolf returns to the wedding cave in Mibu Village. He enters a tent and prays, and the... Alright, I give up. I have no fucking idea how to explain this. This thing reaches a mountainside and just dies, I guess. With this, we are now officially at Fountainhead Palace. Wolf tries to cross a bridge, but is then stopped by the corrupted monk? Yeah, the one we fought in Mibu Village was just an apparition. This one's the real deal. After Wolf defeats the second phase of the fight, the true monk dies, but then her body is puppeteered by a centipede, meaning she's also infested. Again, where does the centipede learn to use a glaive? After embarrassing the true monk, Wolf uses the mortal blade to kill both it and its parasitic host. With the true monk dead, Wolf can continue into Fountainhead Palace. He enters a few rundown buildings and finds enemies unique to this area, palace nobles. Up on the rooftop, he can also find various Okami warriors. While exploring the buildings, Wolf finds an old lady. She tells him to be careful since the palace nobles here feed off of the vitality of the youth. The courtyard ahead is full of these nobles, so it's especially dangerous. Despite the danger, Wolf treks forth that kills every noble in Okami and is- Oh god damn it, no! The idol was right there! Once Wolf reaches that idol and tries to cross the bridge, a giant carp breaks in. Now he has to take a bit of a detour and run through hordes of Okami warriors. He grapples his way up to the top, walks down some stairs, and fights some more. Eventually, he reaches a large Sakura tree and has to fight the mini-boss that sniped me from across the map? Wolf then jumps down into the ocean and finds the roof of a house. On the roof, another lady is standing. She tells him that the normal path to the palace grounds is submerged in water, so he has to swim around. The only issue is, the great treasure carp swims in the water and will kill him if he tries. So Wolf swims underwater, almost gets killed by the great carp, but manages to reach the palace grounds. Once inside, Wolf will find and kill Red Palace nobles. If Wolf opens the door next to him and rests, the lady from the roof will be stabbing a dead noble. She's mad because they apparently tricked her father into becoming one of them. She then exhausts herself and dies. There's also a neat side quest here relating to the great carp. Should Wolf travel to the palace's feeding grounds, he'll find a unique noble. This guy says that his master, the noble fish, must be fed and ringing a nearby bell will call it. Ringing the bell will summon the great carp. If the player has precious bait, they can feed it to the carp. Do it once and you can return to one of two pot nobles seen in the game. The first is pot noble Harunaga, located in Harada Estate. The second is pot noble Koremori, located in the Fountainhead Palace. Talking to either one will give you truly precious bait. Return to the palace feeding grounds and feed the truly precious bait to the great carp. After the carp's eaten it, go to the guardian ape's watering hole idol in the sunken valley. You'll see that the great carp was killed by the truly precious bait. Also, near the head of the carp, you can find a great white whisker. Return to the feeding grounds. Here, that one noble is going to be looking into the water, wondering where the carp is. If you give him the great white whisker, he'll realize the carp died. He says his duties are now complete and he's grateful. He'll then hand you a divine grass. Rest at the idol and you'll notice that the noble has died. 
The lady from the courtyard will be sitting next to him and say that even if not for eternity, my sister and I will always be with you. So these two and the lady from the roof are all family. Wolf returns to the palace grounds and walks up a stairway. He reaches a small cave and finds a woman resting on a stone. Wolf then prays and finally reaches the divine realm. Off in the distance, there's a giant tree that's withered. In front of Wolf, something appears, apparently called a dragon of the tree. More and more of them appear, and Wolf kills all of them. Some of the dragons can be seen praying, and after a lightning strike, a gust of wind nearly blows Wolf back. After the wind's cleared, he can see the divine dragon. This is a giant, white, sword-wielding dragon that's missing its left arm. Wolf has to jump on the tree branches and redirect lightning attacks to the dragon. If he does this enough, the dragon will then furiously swing its blade around. Some more tree branches will appear. He jumps on one, flies up to meet the dragon face to face, and zaps it. He then runs up the sword, pulls out the mortal blade, and stabs the dragon. Now he has the divine dragon's tears needed for immortal severance. Wolf blacks out and wakes back up in Kuro's room. Near the library, Emma can be seen with Ishii. She tells him that while he was gone, Ishii fell to his illness and died. She also tells him that Kuro escaped through the secret passage from the beginning of the game. She hands him the key to the secret passage. Under Ishii's orders, the night jar left smoke signals leading to the secret passage should the player need them. At this point, if Wolf tries to talk to the sculptor of the dilapidated temple, he won't be able to because he isn't there. He's still able to upgrade his prosthetic arm, but the guy isn't actually there. Near the entrance, there will be a merchant that has something to say. He'll say that the sculptor was heading towards the battlefield muttering, THE FLAMES. Let's figure out what that's all about, eh? When returning to the old grave idol, Wolf can travel down the stairway and see that the collapsed bridge from earlier was actually repaired. On it, central forces and Ashina soldiers are fighting each other. Across the bridge, there will be another Jews of the Drunkard reskin, this time Shigekichi of the Red Guard. Wolf kills him and continues through the outskirts of Ashina. Later on, the area that was originally where we fought General Naomori is now covered in fire and claw marks. There's also a sculptor's idol, and resting will transport us to the Ashina outskirts battlefield. Here, a giant monster named the Demon of Hatred will be seen battling Central Forces soldiers. At the end of the fight, the Demon of Hatred will say this. This confirms what I foreshadowed earlier, we just killed the Sculptor. Actually, there's more dialogue the player can unlock during this fight if they do a few things before. If you ask the Sculptor what he saw after killing Lady Butterfly, and before fighting Owl, you give the Sculptor Monkey Boos, Unrefined, and Dragon Spring Sake, Wolf will immediately recognize the Demon of Hatred. When the fight first begins, he'll despairingly say, Sculptor. Before the second phase, he'll say, so these are the flames of hatred. And when killing him, he'll say, Farewell, Sculptor. Now we can return to the Ashina Reservoir, fight our last mini-boss, and make our way over to the Secret Passage. Once there, Wolf uses the key Emma gave him to open the gate. Wolf runs through the tunnel and reaches the Silvergrass Field. Kuro is seen bleeding from his waist, Genichiro having cut him with a black mortal blade. Kuro tells Genichiro that he can't change Ashina's fate with a weapon like that, and says that nobody has the right to the dragon's heritage. Then, for the last time, Genichiro and Wolf clash. Despite wielding the Black Mortal Blade, Genichiro still loses to Wolf. Remember when I said earlier that the Black Mortal Blade can open a gate to the Underworld? Well, the sword requires a sacrifice for that to happen, so knowing this, Genichiro slits his own throat. Through the wound, a hand pops out and grabs the blade. Then an entire body climbs out of Genichiro. Now Wolf has to fight Ishin Ashina at his prime. Welcome Ishin the Sword Saint. This version of Ishin is extremely powerful, wielding his blade, a spear, a gun, and even lightning. Despite the hardships, Wolf overpowers Ishin. Ishin, having accepted defeat, allows Wolf to give him an honorable death. Yeah. 
Now Wolf has to find Kuro lying in the field. Once he does, he's given a choice. He can choose to give Kuro the Dragon's Tears, the Dragon's Tears and the Ever Blossom, or the Dragon's Tears and the Frozen Tears. The first option gives players the Immortal Severance ending, the second gives them the Purification ending, and the third gives them the Return ending. In the Immortal Severance ending, Kuro will drink the Dragon's Tears. Wolf pulls out the Mortal Blade and holds it above Kuro's chest. Kuro will grab the blade and tell Wolf to kill him. Wolf then drives the blade into Kuro. We arrive at the dilapidated temple where Wolf is now a sculptor. Emma sitting behind him is holding his prosthetic arm just in case another shinobi like Wolf arrives. In the purification ending, Kuro again drinks the dragon's tears. He'll then actually die this time. Wolf pulls out the mortal blade and uses it to behead himself. Emma can now be seen praying at Wolf's grave, and reborn Kuro joins in. Kuro decides to leave Ashina and live his life to the fullest up until he can peacefully pass away. Now for the final true ending. Wolf will hand Kuro the dragon in frozen tears. After fainting, Wolf picks Kuro up and carries him to the inner sanctum. At the inner sanctum, Kuro is lying in front of the divine child. She basically absorbs his life essence, allowing the two to become one. After another cut to black, the divine child, now in a different setup, is talking to the children of the rejuvenating waters. She says that the trip to the west is going to be a very long one, and asks the wolf if he's still determined to join her. He says yes, and the two wander off into the sunset. And that was Sekiro's Shadows Die Twice. I really like the storytelling in this game. The negative consequences of immortality from what I've seen online seems to be a recurring theme in FromSoft games, but despite that I still thoroughly enjoyed the story here. Each main and supporting character has enough development to make any emotional attachment to them worth it. There are a few NPCs that end up having really depressing side quests, and I like that a lot. Out of all the videos that I covered on this channel, Sekiro probably has the best world building as well. All the areas, despite being different in style, still feel relatively close to each other and each have their own personality. Mibu Village full of the undead and buried under Ashina has an ancient feeling to it. The Sunken Valley, an area almost uninhabited by man, is full of mountains and crevices. Senpo Temple has the makings of a true monastery, but it's kind of ugly to match the dark path the Senpo monks turn to. Alright, you know the drill, the story's done, let's talk gameplay. Around here, I like to start with the very basics, so I'll begin with the UI like always. At the bottom left is your vitality bar. Above it, there will be two circles, or three depending on how elite you are into the game. These are your resurrection nodes. At the bottom right, you can see a tiny icon for whichever quick item, prosthetic tool, and ninjutsu technique you have equipped. Also, you'll be able to see how many spirit emblems you have. In between those two is your posture meter. On the right, you can also occasionally see how much Zen you have. At the top right, you can see how much experience and skill points you have. For bosses and mini bosses, at the top of the screen, you can see both their vitality and posture. Your two main stats in the game are vitality and attack power. In order to increase your vitality and posture, you need to find items called prayer beads. It's not showing anything for me because I already got all of them, but most of the time you can find prayer beads by defeating bosses and mini bosses. Collecting four will allow you to increase your vitality and posture. Your attack power can also be increased by defeating bosses. Defeating a main boss will award you with a memory of that boss. Going to a nearby sculptor's idol and confronting your memory will increase your attack power and also create a remnant just in case you want to fight that boss again. In most hack and slash games, your goal is to completely drain your enemy's health bar until they die. Sekiro takes a different approach. Sure, you can still do that, but the game wants you to break the enemy's posture. Deflecting enough of the enemy's attacks can fill up their posture bar, which will allow you to perform a death blow on them even before that vitality is empty. However, the enemy's posture will quickly recover if they still have a lot of vitality, so you have to focus on both. Both you and your enemies have posture, so you can break theirs, but they can break yours, so you have to be careful. The thing is, not every enemy attack can be perfectly guarded or deflected. Sometimes an enemy will perform what's called a perilous attack. You'll know a perilous attack when you see a red kanji appear above the enemy. Perilous attacks can't be guarded or deflected, so trying to block those will just get you killed. There are four types of perilous attacks, thrust attacks, sweeps, grabs, and lightning attacks. Instead of blocking, you have four ways to counter them. The first is simply dodging the attack. 
The second you can only do on thrust attacks and it's called a Makiri counter, dodging towards the attack while you step on the enemy's blade or spear and deal a good amount of posture damage. The third only works on sweep attacks and it's a jump kick. Jump over the enemy's attack and then bounce off of them to deal some posture damage. Lightning attacks can be countered with a lightning reversal. Jump in the air and as soon as the lightning hits you, deflect and then attack to redirect the lightning to your enemy. In Sekiro, there are 5 status effects that can be applied to enemies, but more so affect you. These are Burn, Poison, Terror, Shock, and Enfeeblement. Burn will deal minor vitality damage and also prevent posture recovery. Poison will gradually damage vitality. Terror is a status effect exclusive to apparitions and will instantly kill you. If you are on the ground when affected by shock, it will deal heavy vitality damage and stun you. Enfeeblement is exclusive to the nobles of Fountainhead Palace. If you are afflicted with enfeeblement, your vitality and movement speed will be greatly decreased and your resurrection will be limited. In other words, unless you can survive for a whole minute, it's an insta-kill. Sometimes dying isn't the end of the fight. Once you lose all of your vitality, you're given the option to resurrect. If you resurrect, you come back to life with half of your health. However, you can't resurrect again immediately after. In order to do so, you need to either rest at a sculptor's idol or kill more enemies and you'll be able to resurrect again. There is an item you can earn that will negate this restriction, but for the most part, you can only resurrect once. On the topic of resurrection, there is a mechanic called Unseen Aid. Normally, whenever you die, you'll lose half of your sen and experience points. But with Unseen Aid, that won't happen. Whenever you die and Unseen Aid is triggered, you'll retain all of your sen and experience points when coming back. The max amount you can have is 30%, but triggering Dragon Rod will decrease it by a set percent. Luckily, offering a Dragon's Blood Droplet will reset it to 30%. The rest of the gameplay mechanics are broken out into different sections, so we'll end this one here. Wolf's greatest weapon, apart from his Kusabi Maru, is his prosthetic arm. Different weapons in the game can be loaded onto this prosthetic and be used in battle. However, these abilities aren't unlimited. They cost a form of currency called Spirit Emblem. Spirit Emblems can be frequently dropped by killing enemies or bought with Sen at Sculptor's Idols. All your prosthetic tools will cost you anywhere from 1 to 3 Spirit Emblems and you can carry a max of 20 at a time. Let's go over what all the prosthetic tools are. The loaded shuriken is a simple shuriken that acts as, really, your only ranged option. The flame vent will shoot out a burst of flame and inflict the burn status onto your enemy. The loaded axe will swing an axe towards your enemy and is really good for breaking enemy shields. The shinobi firecracker will throw out firecrackers and stun your enemy. The loaded spear will thrust the spear towards your enemy and drag them back to you. The mist raven is arguably the hardest to master and you can use it to counter an enemy's attack at the last second. The Mist Raven can also be used to perform the Lightning Reversal technique. The Loaded Umbrella acts as a shield and can negate most damage. The Sabi Maru will deal a flurry of attacks and inflict the poison status. The Divine Abduction can be used to turn your enemy around and give you a free death blow and even be used to instantly kill certain enemies. The Finger Whistle can be used to distract a specific enemy or cause beasts to attack their allies. Your prosthetic tools can be acquired and upgraded by the sculptor once you find the right materials. Throughout the world, you can find materials that your tools will require to earn upgrades. Most of these are metals, like scrap iron, adamantine scraps, and fulminated mercury. There are, however, upgrades that will require a specific material. Examples are Okinaga's flame vent requiring the pine resin ember, and Malkatent requiring Malkatent's ring. There's also a material lapis lazuli that's needed for the highest level of upgrades. You can only get 10 in a single playthrough and you need 12 total to get the upgrades, so you need to do New Game Plus at least once to get enough Lapis Lazuli. Now let's talk about what these high level upgrades are. The Loaded Umbrella can be upgraded to the Phoenix Lilac and Suzaku's Lotus Umbrellas, which reduce Terror and Burn buildup respectively. The Divine Abduction can be upgraded to the Golden Vortex, which will cause the enemies to also drop golden items. The Loaded Shuriken can be upgraded to the Phantom Kunai, which acts like Lady Butterfly's Kunai, and the Sen Throw, which will throw your Sen at enemies. The Loaded Spear can be upgraded to the Leaping Flame, which will perform a sweep attack that deals burn damage. The Mist Raven can be upgraded to the Great Feather Mist Raven, which leaves a fiery trail after using it.
There are a slew of quick items the player can use to their advantage. These can be found all over Sekiro's world and can be used at any time. They serve a lot of uses from healing, to defense, to boosting attack power, to stunning enemies. Here I'm not going to go through all of them because like I said, there's a lot. I'm only going to go through the most important ones and then separate them by category. The first category is healing items. These are items that are meant to help you recover vitality or posture. One item you'll always have is your healing gourd. You can use your healing gourd to recover a large amount of health and uses will reset when resting at a sculptor's idol. You can increase the number of uses by finding gourd seeds in the world and giving them to Emma. The next is pellets. This is the most common item dropped by enemies and will gradually recover your health. You can only carry three at a time. Another healing item is thrice. Like I said, this is pellets on steroids. You can obtain rice by talking to the divine child and she'll give you some. You can only carry one at a time until she gives you another. There's another version of this fine snow that the divine child will also give you if you complete the return quest line. This is more powerful than rice, but I forgot to claim it so I can't show it. There are two kinds of persimmons, regular and taro. Both of these persimmons are the posture version of pellets and rice, gradually recovering your posture over time. Sweet rice balls can be obtained by Kuro later in the game, and will recover both vitality and posture at the same time. The final healing item, Divine Grass, is the rarest one in the game. This will fully restore your vitality and clear all status effects. Our next category is Sugars and Spirit Falls. These are items that can be found in the world or dropped by various enemies, mostly Senpo monks. There are five different kinds of sugars that all provide different temporary buffs. These are Akko Sugar, Ungo Sugar, Gokan Sugar, Gachin Sugar, and Yashiriku Sugar. Akko will increase your damage, Ungo will reduce vitality damage taken, Gokan will reduce posture damage, Gachin will suppress your presence, and Yashiriku will take away half of your health but will greatly increase your damage. Spirit Falls are the same as their sugar counterparts but are reusable and only cost spirit emblems. Each of these five Spirit Falls can be dropped with a few headless bosses in the game. Next up is what I call powders and medicines. These are items that are meant to reduce buildup and increase resistance to different status effects. The first is the powders. The antidote powder will completely heal poison and reduce buildup. The contact medicine will inflict both of the weaker poison and also ward off more dangerous poisons. The regular and ministry dowsing powder will cure and reduce the burn status. The pacifying agent cures and reduces terror buildup, and the eel liver cures and reduces shock buildup. There's also different gourds that serve similar purposes. They don't completely clear the status effect like the powders, but they can still reduce buildup and refill when resting. These are the mottled purple gourd for terror, withered red gourd for burn, and green mossy gourd for poison. Now let's talk about Mibu balloons. These are items that will increase the rate at which something drops, which is useful if you're farming for a specific thing. There are five Mibu balloons of the game. The Possession Balloon increases the chance for enemies to drop rare items. The Balloon of Wealth increases the scent an enemy will drop when killed. The Balloon of Spirit will increase the chances for an enemy to drop spirit emblems, and the Balloon of Soul lets you acquire more resurrective power. The fifth one, the Pilgrimage Balloon, applies to all four of these effects at the same time, but is only obtained by completing Black Hat Badger's questline. This next category I don't know how to categorize, so let's just call it miscellaneous. Here I'll be listing a lot of other useful items. Bundled Jizo statues will give you another resurrective node. Ceramic shards can be used to distract an enemy. The Ceremonial Tonto will return half of your vitality to five extra spirit emblems. The Divine Confetti will increase your damage against Apparitions and Demons. The Fistful of Ash will stun your enemy for a short period. The Snap Sea will dispel any enemy illusions. The Oil will increase an enemy's vulnerability to burn. The Red Lump will give you red eyes and decrease flinching but also prohibit resurrection. And the Bite Down will negate your resurrection restriction. That's pretty much every quick item you have at your disposal. Throughout the game, Wolf can obtain different skill trees that contain different kinds of skills. There are three different types of skills, all color-coded. Yellow skills are latent skills, blue ones are martial arts, and the red ones are combat arts. Latent skills are passive abilities that are always active. Examples include increasing healing gourd effectiveness, increasing your stealth, increasing the number of spirit emblems you can hold, etc. 
I like to think of the martial arts as more of a utility since they provide more defensive options and more ways to use your prosthetic tool. The best martial art in the game is the Mercury counter which I mentioned earlier. There's also the mid-air deflection and run and slide and then living force which imbues your sword with whatever element your prosthetic tool was. Combat arts are your offensive moves and can be used at any time during a fight. I'll go more in depth in a bit but one thing to note is that not every skill in the game can be obtained through these skill trees. There are a few like One Mind, the Mebo Breathing Technique, Mortal Draw, and Dragon Flash that are obtained by defeating bosses or progressing through the story. In order to acquire skills, you need skill points. After filling an entire experience bar, you'll unlock one skill point, and you'll need three to five for most skills. You'll also need esoteric texts to get most of the skill trees in the game. You earn the Shinobi Esoteric Text by earning a skill point. You also earn the Prosthetic Esoteric Text by unlocking three prosthetic tools. You earn the Ashina Esoteric Text by completing the Tengu of Ashina's questline. You earn the Senpo Esoteric Text by going to a hidden shrine in Senpo Temple. And you can earn the Mushin Esoteric Text by talking to Tengu at the Great Serpent Shrine, if you've mastered the skill tree by then. Now I'll go through what the best skills are in each skill tree. First up is the Shinobi Arts. The Mercury Counter is by and by your best defensive option, especially with the Shinobi Eyes skill, so get it as soon as possible considering there's an early mini boss that teaches you how to use it. Breath of Life Light is a really good way to recover vitality either during a boss or during a combat encounter with multiple enemies. A Shinobi's Karma can be really useful since it increases how many spirit emblems you can hold. Suppressed Presence is useful for stealth scenarios although they're far and few between. Shadow Rush is a cool looking combat art but I found it to be one of my least used. Now for the prosthetic arts, the Sculptor's Karma further increases your Spirit Emblem capacity which is always good. Emma's Medicine is really good, it makes it so you don't have to waste your healing cores so early in a fight. Living Force can be useful if you want to make some stylish combos with stuff like the Flame Vent. Fagnum Blade, Projected Force, and Chasing Slice are all useful, but they aren't as necessary as the rest of the skills. Next is the Ashina Arts. These arts employ the style of the Ashina Clan. Ichimonji and Ichimonji Double are two of the best combat arts in the game. They're a great way to stagger your enemy and deal some great posture damage. Breath of Nature is as useful as Breath of Life, especially during fights like Sword Saint Ishin. Ascending and Descending Karp are a great way to add some passive damage when deflecting, so you can still damage your enemy without attacking them. The Ashina Cross, while not the best, is still a good combat art. Overall, the Ashina arts are probably some of the best in the game. The Temple Arts employ the style of the Senpo Monks. The Praying Strikes only really serve as a good way to keep the pressure going in a fight. Senpo Leaping Kicks and High Monk are stylish ways to counter sweep attacks, but it wastes more time than just jumping over them. Virtuous Deed is pretty much useless unless you're trying to farm for a specific material or set. Devotion can be useful since it increases how long your sugars are active, but I doubt you'd be using them too frequently to warrant the skill. Overall, this skill tree has its uses, but not as much as the rest. The final skill tree to unlock is the Mushin Arts. This skill tree mixes the best combat arts from each of the previous four trees and makes upgraded versions of them. The Empowered Mortal Draw takes longer to wind up, but provides increased damage and range when compared to the regular Mortal Draw. The Shadow Fall simply adds a couple of overhead attacks to the end of your Shadow Rush. The Spiral Cloud Passage adds a bunch of heavy hitting swings. On its own is not much to write home about, but you can mix it with a Bestow and Jutsu technique and it can become a really good combat art. Last thing I want to touch up on is a question you may have had just now. What the fuck is a Bestow technique? Well, let me explain. There are three ninjutsu techniques in this game. When you perform a backstab death blow, you'll be able to perform one of them at the cost of about 5-7 to seven spirit emblems. These are Bestow, Puppeteer, and Blood Smoke. Blood Smoke is acquired by defeating Genichiro Way of Tomoe for the first time, and creates a cloud of smoke to allow for more stealth. Puppeteer is acquired after beating the Folding Screen Monkeys and turns an enemy into an ally for a short period. The Soul is acquired after finishing off the Headless Ape and extends the reach of your normal attacks. That's about 80% of everything you need to know about the skills in this game. So we all know what a boss rush is, right? Well, for the one person watching that won't know, here you go. In video games, a boss rush is a game mode where the player has to fight all that game's bosses in a single life. 
if they die at any point during the boss rush, they get sent back to the beginning. Well, Sekiro got its own boss rush and a post-launch update, and these are called the Gauntlets of Strength. There are a total of four Gauntlets of Strength to conquer. Divine, Air, and Severance are earned by obtaining the Immortal Severance, Purification, or Return Endings. Shura is earned by obtaining the Shura Ending, and Mortal Journey is earned by completing the other three Gauntlets. The Divine Air Gauntlet features Gyobu Oniwa, Lady Butterfly, and Inner Genichiro. The Shura Gauntlet features Emma the Gentle Blade, Ishinashina, the Demon of Hatred, and Inner Father. The Severance Gauntlet features the Guardian Ape, Great Shinobi Owl, True Monk, Genichiro Wave Tomoe, and Inner Ishii. The Mortal Journey Gauntlet features every single one of these bosses. One thing to note is that the inner bosses I mentioned are actually considered different bosses from their original counterparts, which I'll explore in a bit. When starting a Gauntlet of Strength, you'll be able to preview what all the bosses for that run are going to be. Once you start, you have to fight whoever the first boss is. After beating any boss, you'll have the options to rest, purchase more spirit emblems, move on to the next fight, or quit the run. You just have to rinse and repeat until defeating the final boss of the run. Three of four of these are actually worth it because they provide some good items. Completing the Severance Gauntlet earns you the Tengu Outfit. Completing the Shura Gauntlet earns you the Shura Outfit. And completing the Divine Air Gauntlet earns you the Sakura Dance Combat Art. As for the reward for completing the Mortal Journey Gauntlet, it's nothing. There's literally no award for beating it. No XP, no skin, no combat art, nothing. There are a total of four skins a player can equip on Wolf. These are Wolf, Ashina, Tengu, and Shura. Wolf is the default app that you use throughout the game. Ashina is earned by completing the game for the first time and represents the sculptor when he was still a shinobi. The Tengu outfit represents the Tengu of Ashina. The Shura outfit gives the player an idea of what Wolf becomes after the Shura ending. I should also mention the Sakura Dance combat art here as well. It's a series of three leaping slashes that can also be used in conjunction with mid-air prosthetic attacks. The Sakura Dance can also be mixed with the Flame Vent and can be an effective lightning reversal tool. Sekiro is the first game on my channel that features a new game plus mode, so I'll also have to explain what that is. In most games, after completing it for the first time, you're given an option to start a new game plus run. In these runs, you have to restart the game from the very beginning, but you get to retain all of the gear you earned in your previous playthrough. Sometimes you can also earn items exclusive to new game plus runs like the Scap Slag in God War 2018. Sekiro also has a new game plus feature that adds some new mechanics to your next run. After completing the game, you'll get a pop-up asking if you want to start a new playthrough. You can choose yes, but if you choose no, you'll have to go to the Sculptor's Idol at the Dilapidated Temple to select the Start Next Playthrough button. Doing so will send you back to the game's opening, but you'll still retain most of your gear. All story-related items, such as the Mortal Draw and the Mibu Breathing Technique skills are taken away from you until you unlock them again. There's also New Game Plus scaling, so you aren't just going to clean house against every boss in the game unless you're really skilled. Another fun fact is that after you unlock the Dilapidated Temple Idol, your currently equipped skin shows up in all future cutscenes. When starting a New Game Plus run while talking to Kuro in the Moonview Tower, he'll ask you if anything's on your mind. At this point, you can choose whether or not to give Kuro his charm. Holding onto the charm will let you play the game normally, but giving Kuro his charm will start what the community calls a charmless run. Without Kuro's charm, you tread a path of immense hardships. In Charmless runs, the rate at which you earn Sen and Experience is increased by 20%, but the enemies have more vitality and damage, and you receive ship damage from blocking. Should you wish to return to the normal difficulty, you can retrieve Kuro's charm when talking to the Sculptor. However, you can't go back to a Charmless run if you abandon it, it's all or nothing. After the fight with General Tensen, you can take a detour and find a shrine in Senpo Temple dedicated to a Bell Demon. Ringing the Bell present will inflict you with the Sinister Burden Curse, this will increase the chance for enemies to drop rare items, but will also increase their vitality and damage. Should you wish to dispel the Sinister Burden, you can find the Bell Demon item in your inventory and simply use it. If you ever want to receive Sinister Burden again, you can go back to the temple and ring the bell. I'm mentioning this now because the negative effects of the Bell Demon do stack with those of the Charmless run, so you can play Sekiro in Ultra Nightmare mode. The Bell Demon doesn't carry over to New Game Plus though, you have to find the temple again on your next playthrough.
I know it's a big topic of debate over what's considered a boss and a mini boss in this game, so just know these are how I personally categorize all the big name fights in Sekiro. I won't be counting the Great Serpent and Great Carp as bosses or mini bosses because, yes, they give you achievements, but they only die as part of a quest line. Alright, let's begin. The Alshader Generals, I feel, are probably the most bland out of all the mini bosses here. They actually do provide a challenge for you on your first playthrough, but in terms of design and attack patterns, I don't know, they just feel bland. As with other mini bosses in the game, the Shinobi Hunter teaches players how to use the Makiri counter. I know I'm just repeating myself, but the Makiri counter is seriously the best defensive option you have, so it's nice to have a boss that does nothing but thrust attacks. The Chained Ogre is another learning opportunity, this time for unblockable grab attacks and how to use your prosthetic tools effectively. With its vulnerability to burn, you can also kind of kick its ass since you should have gotten the oil on the flame vent by now. Fuck the Blazing Bull. The Seven Ashen of Spears, this early at least, can put up a pretty decent fight. The one near the Moonview Tower especially gave me trouble since I'd sometimes find it difficult to perform a Makiri counter given the elevated arena. The Ashen of Spears you fight right before the Sword State Ishin fight can also be pretty difficult if you don't get rid of his ally as soon as possible. They're essentially the Ashen of Generals, but with an extra bit of difficulty. The four Juzo the Drunkard variants we find can either have moderate difficulty or just be infuriating depending on who they're partnered with. The first one just has Harada Bandits, plus we can have Nogami fight with us so it should be easy. The one in Mibu Village is accompanied by monkeys that can easily be killed off with a few shurikens, so again, not much difficulty. The second Harada Juzo and Shigikichi, however, can be quite a challenge. The former because he's accompanied by an interior ministry soldier, and the latter because of the central forces. On their own, especially this late, not a challenge at all, but their allies can make or break the fight. The two Snake Eyes bosses can be a pain in the ass. The one outside the gun fort is accompanied by a suppressing fire, so unless you lure her into cover, you're bound to get shot by her allies. The one in the poison pool is accompanied by, well, poison. She also has gun fort allies that can seriously pack a punch, so your best option is to sneak around and kill all of them first. The Shichimin warriors can be pretty difficult, especially since they can inflict you with terror really quickly, but if you have the right items, it can be a cakewalk. And by the right items, I mean the model Purple Gore, Divine Confetti, Akko Sugar, and Phoenix Lilac Umbrella. But they're also pretty much optional, since they can be found in fairly obscure areas, so if you want to give up, that's perfectly fine. Fuck the Headless. The Mist Noble shouldn't even be considered a mini-boss or a boss, but here we are. I get that the real challenge was navigating the Mist in order to get to the house in the first place, but come on, even Okami Leader Shizu put up more of a fight. Hey, speaking of... Okami Leader Shizu is pretty similar to the Mist Noble in that both are complete pushovers, but again, at least this guy attacked us. His shock balls are bound to get you once or twice, but once you actually reach him, it's lights out for him. The Ashina Elites, depending on when you fight them, can be pretty deadly to start. One of their moves can deal really good vitality damage against you, but once you learn that it's their only move and deflecting it deals good posture damage, it becomes a cakewalk. The long arm centipedes are, I feel, in the same boat as the Ashina Elites. They unleash a flurry of attacks that can seriously drain your posture and damage, but if you learn to perfectly deflect most of the attacks, you'll do fine. They also only have two moves, a little onslaught and a grab attack that can be countered with a jump kick. If you need to, you can use a Gokan Sugar to reduce your posture damage, but it's not necessary. The Armored Warrior is a gimmick boss, but a pretty good one. You can't directly damage his vitality, you have to break his posture enough to make an opening for a death blow. You also have to trick him into opening the window so that you can kick him out of it. That's really all the fight boils down to, but I still have fun with it. An alternate way to beat him is by deflecting his rushdown attack right in front of an open window. Fun fact, I originally posted this clip on the Sekiro subreddit and a lot of people were confused when I said that this isn't the intended way to beat him. The Lone Shadows are fairly difficult but not really challenging. They are pretty much the mini boss versions of the interior ministry soldiers but they can occasionally inflict you with poison. Once you get their attack patterns down, it's as easy said as done. If anything, again, their companions are the biggest issue. The one by the Great Serpent Shrine is guarded by wolves and monkeys, the one in the Harada Estate can summon wolves, and the one in the Ashina Dojo is aided by an interior ministry soldier. As far as I know, those are all the mini-bosses of the game, so let's move on to the more interesting bosses of Sekiro. Let's start 
start things off with Gyobu Oniwa. Gyobu is one of the best bosses of the game when it comes to providing a learning opportunity. He teaches the players about uneven attack patterns, grappling towards an enemy in combat, and experimenting with your prosthetic tools. He's also a good showcase of your general mastery in later playthroughs. On your first run, he's bound to give you trouble, but in later runs, you can find yourself beating him on your first try. He also adds the always iconic. My name! So, all in all, a good opening boss. Lady Butterfly is going to be the most difficult combat encounter early on. She can damage your posture with a flurry of attacks that ends with a perilous attack. She constantly jumps around and stays in the air, and she uses her illusions. If you don't have any snap seeds, she's definitely going to give you a hard time. The best prosthetic tool I can recommend is the loaded shuriken so you can swat her out of the air. This fight is possible without snap seeds, that much becomes clear on later playthroughs, but on your first run, she's bound to give you a hard time. There are three different versions of Genichiro. Genichiro Ashina, Genichiro Way of Tomoe, and Inner Genichiro. With all three versions of the fight in mind, I consider Genichiro to be the one true skill check in the game. He's a pretty early boss and there's not much of a cheese strat I can recommend for the guy. All I can say is, get good. It takes full mastery of the deflection and Makiri counter in order to beat this guy. If you can beat Genichiro, you're ready for anything. I will say, however, it is kind of unfair to have your first experience with a lightning reversal be with Way of Tomoe and not a regular enemy. But the same logic from earlier applies to inner Genichiro as well. Sure, he has a Sakura dance which is bound to get you, but mastering him means you're ready to take on the Severance and Shura gauntlets. And at the same time, your final Genichiro fight should be a complete pushover compared to the earlier encounter signaling a sense of mastery, both from Wolf and the player. I'm going to be completely honest guys, the floating screen monkeys are so forgettable that I had to add them into this script as a last minute addition. Sure, they can provide a puzzling challenge on your first run, but when you're just trying to beat the game again on later playthroughs, it becomes a chore. They're as much a boss as the Great Serpent and the Great Carp, but the difference is the monkeys give you a battle memory, for some reason. I'm gonna guess the Guardian Ape is the reason so many of you guys abandoned the game. I'm only saying that because I was one of those people. I couldn't get past the fight, so I eventually gave up and quit for a few months. I decided to attempt it again after so long, and after a long fight, I eventually beat him. I know I said Genichiro was a true skill check, but the Ape is the make or break. Its first phase is full of erratic attacks, a rage shit flinging attack to keep you in check, and constant perilous grab attacks. And after all is said and done, and you thought you beat him, he has a second phase? Well, at least that second phase is much easier. It has a sword now, so you can deflect its attacks. Also, fun fact, bring the loaded spear into the second phase. If it doesn't overhead swake and you deflect it, it'll fall over. Drive your loaded spear into its throat and deal some really good posture damage. The corrupted monk in Mibu Village is such a difficult but good boss. Her posture recovery is nutty, you basically aren't dealing any damage without a divine confetti. Her glaive attacks are bound to get you. But her boss music is hauntingly beautiful. I actually like the arena quite a bit, not as much as the Ashina rooftop, but this wedding cave entrance aesthetically looks better. It's pretty much an endurance test, but a more fun one than the pacer test. If you can't tell, I'm saving my praises for the true monk version of the fight so I don't have much to say here. Much like Genichiro, there's three different versions of Owl, Great Shinobi Owl, Owl Father, and Inner Father. All three of these rely on a certain gimmick, that gimmick being exploiting everything you've done up to this point. Owl can use Shinobi Firecrackers, he can inflict you with poison, the two Father versions can use the Mist Raven against you, he knows how to use Shadow Rush, and he can even Mikiri counter your thrust attacks. His entire shtick is just being a massive troll, and goddamn if it isn't the pinnacle of Sekiro boss design. I remember still being satisfied after he killed me because each death was a learning opportunity. How do you counter your own counter? That's all these fights boil down to. It's a big mind game over who can use the same tools better. And that feeling after beating Inner Father, probably the most difficult boss in the game, without taking damage, is exhilarating. To be honest, there's not much I can say about Emma the Gentle Blade. Sure, she has dangerous attacks, but she only exists as a prelude or setup to Ishin Ashina's fight. Both of them have the unblockable grab attack, both can use the Ashina cross, and they even have the same 3 hit combo strength. This fight pretty much only exists to show you how successful your Ishin Ashina fight is going to be. Because if Emma gets you here, you're probably done for there. Depending on how many runs it takes before you attempt Shura, Ishin Ashina can either be the easier or harder version of Sword Saint Ishi. Both first phases use most of the same combos, use Ichimonji Double and Ashina Cross, and have the same thrust attack that you can be Kiri counter. But the second phase is definitely something. 
here, Ishii can cover the entire arena in fire, his Ichimonji is followed up by a broad fire swing, and he can even throw a wall of fire at you. His one mind attack can be extremely dangerous if you get caught in it. Overall, it's reasonably difficult for a final boss to counter, but not as cool as his other versions. The true monk fight has no business being as great as it is. For a character that has absolutely no plot relevance and shows up out of nowhere twice, she sure is one of the best bosses in Sekiro. Again, I love her boss theme, but the Fountainhead Bridge is probably the best arena for a fight at all. I love the Sakura trees and the overall aesthetic of it, and the increased verticality with the trees makes it all the more unique. I also can't explain how big my brain felt after catching the stealth death blow that cancels out the entire second phase. In her third phase, she becomes so much more erratic in her actions since she's controlled by the centipede. Her attacks are faster, more aggressive, and even more dangerous. From start to end, one of the best bosses in the game. The Divine Dragon is the easiest boss in the game that's actually a fight. If you simplify it, all you do is jump on tree branches, catch lightning, and redirect it to the dragon. It's not even an actual lightning reversal since you don't take damage from it during the fight. The sheer easiness of the fight is the entire point of it. The main focus of the fight is the atmosphere. You're fighting the dragon your people worship in the literal divine realm. You get to just bask in the ethereal feeling of this fight, and it's also kind of satisfying being able to kill it. The hard part, reaching the Fountainhead Palace in the first place, was already done, so it's kind of nice to not have to stress over getting the Dragon Tears. The Demon of Hatred is the most un boss in the game. For starters, in a game where most of your bosses are ninja, shinobi, or shogunate troops, you have to fight this giant demonic beast. It's also physically impossible to kill him by just deflecting his attacks, you have to completely wipe his vitality three times. He has countless perilous attacks, a really good rage option, can very quickly inflict burn on you, has an aerial slam attack that has a lot of damage that can easily mess you up before his third phase even begins. And honestly, I had a lot of fun with it. This boss, in my opinion, is meant to test your adaptability. If you can beat this guy, you can beat anything the game throws at you. This boss was also the only one that made me feel bittersweet after killing it. I felt bad knowing I was killing one of my only allies in the game, but happy knowing I was putting him out of his misery. There's a version of the Finger Whistle prosthetic called Malcontent that can deal good vitality damage against him. There's a theory that this works because the whistle reminds the sculptor of his training GF Kingfisher. And that's honestly kind of sad. Holy shit, if it wasn't for God of War 3 Zeus fight existing, Sword Saint Ishin would be my favorite final boss of all time. This guy is Sekiro's true test of strength. He puts everything before you and sees if you're capable of overcoming it all. The Ashina Cross and HMOG Double, Raged Attacks, Lightning Reversals, Thrust Attacks, Sweeps, and even a gun. For his neutral special, he wields a gun. You are truly fighting the Swordsman of Legend, the Master of the Blade, Spear, Thunder, and Glock 19. Beating Sword Saint Ishii means you can overcome anything in Sekiro. He's also the best example of true mastery in the game. On my first run, it took me about 4-5 to five hours to beat him, but now I'm beating him on my first try. I also love his lore during the fight. His main motto is, Hesitation is Defeat, meaning that if you stop for even a moment to heal or apply sugar, you're done for. It takes beating him on an equal level of aggression. He also perfectly accepts defeat at the end of the fight didn't agree with Genichiro wanting to preserve Ashina by heretical means, he just wanted to honor his grandson and get a good fight out of it, and he got it. Music in anything, not just video games, can be the real make or break of the scene. Depending on what emotions your scene is trying to convey, having the right background music can only amplify it. Having a somber song when a character dies can help set the mood, or having no music at all can make the scene feel more realistic. If your main character is fighting a giant monster, having breakneck music can give your viewers the same adrenaline rush your character is having. You're horrible! Oh, oh, what took you so long? Pussy. Having the right song playing a suspenseful scene in a horror movie can fill the viewer with the same dread and terror the characters on screen are.
key word here is atmosphere. Atmosphere is the driving force behind the OST of any movie, show, or game. Now let's see how Sekiro tackles its atmosphere. Serpent Valley and Great Serpent in conjunction help to set the scene for the first Great Serpent encounter. It's a pretty quiet song all around and yet it still fits the scenery. On Serpent Valley there's even noises that sound like they'd come from a rattlesnake. Harada Estate Dragon Spring River is overall kind of drab. There's mostly only two or three instruments that play and it's a somber tone. This makes sense since the setting is a small town that was raided by bandits so of course it would be sad. To add on to this, Up in Flames, when we reach the actual estate, is a song that accompanies burning buildings. All I can imagine is despair, the despair of people who are run out of their homes by bandits, probably not even with their families. Fountainhead Palace has an air of nobility to it, it's fittingly majestic. If you look past the enfeeblement pricks, the guys with the balls and the Sakura Bowl, the Fountainhead Palace is actually pretty beautiful. You get to see the petals of the Sakura cheese flying through the air, the courtyards feel serene, and the path leading to the Divine Dragon is especially great. It just sucks that aside from the true monk, none of the fights in the palace are really any good. The Guardian Ape's boss theme is as erratic as the ape itself. You never know where the song is going to go next, much like the fight. It's got enough chaos to fit in perfectly with the ape. It's got that mix of the dread from the horror movies and the breakneck pace of action games. The ape is a naturally terrifying boss and the song only amplifies it. The Demon of Hatred's boss theme is pretty much a mix of all the attributes I mentioned earlier. It's got that horror vibe since we're up against a giant flaming red monster, it's got a fairly high pace to match what type of song it is, a boss theme, and it's also partially bittersweet. As I already mentioned, this is the death of the sculptor, one of our only allies, and we're killing him. The second half of the song matches that feeling. Your victory over this beast is a well-earned one, but it's also hard to say goodbye to such a close ally, especially in this fashion. Remember when I mentioned the majestic feeling of the Fountainhead Palace? Well, the Divine Dragon's boss theme is that times 20. We're fighting what's pretty much a god in its own realm. Between us and the dragon, there's just gusts of wind and tree branches. The song is also uplifting, which can be taken in a literal sense, but can also be empowering. We're so close to the end of the journey. This is the end game. It's going to be pretty hard for me to put Sword Saint into words. It just has that final boss feel to it, much like Brothers of Blood did for God of War 3. And honestly, this song just gives me another reason to gush over the Sword Saint Ishin fight. I fought gods, giant robots, the ruler of hell, 15 foot tall humanoid monsters, the creator of the universe. Rarely do I ever fight someone on the exact same playing field as me. That's what Ishin at his core really is, and this song helps give the player that feeling. The Owl is a great accompanying song for one of the most difficult bosses in the game. All three versions of Owl and her father especially are nothing but relentless attacks, and this song matches the tempo to a T. The same quick tempo, intensity, etc. all meant to keep the adrenaline rush on. So yeah, Sekiro's soundtrack is overall pretty great. Shout out to Yuka Kitamura, who's apparently been the main composer behind almost every FromSoft game, including Elden Ring. Now that's dedication to the craft. Honestly, I'm just surprised you made it to the end of the video. Or if you just skipped to the conclusion for whatever reason, that's fine as well. Thanks for taking two hours out of your day to watch this. I just want to leave with a few things that I feel are important. The first is this. I made a community post about this already, but I won't be able to make several idiots react to the Elden Ring Awards. The show was extremely boring, bar the Hades 2 reveal and Bill Clinton kid. There were technical difficulties all over the place, and I accidentally deleted the VOD because I mislabeled it. The second is this. Making this video in the first place was a colossal task because my mental health has slowly been getting worse. Because of this, I might just not start working on any sort of video at all for the next few weeks. I'll still have a social media presence, but I won't be working on any big projects like this. Almost I do have the motivation to keep working like this, my next video would be on Hi-Fi Rush because oh my god it is so good. Alright, that's the end of the conclusion. Thanks for watching. All I want to say is please stop posting about Hogwarts Legacy for the love of god I am tired of hearing about it. Also, fire Elliot Gindy and recast Tainari. Alright, see ya.